Oh hi, I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster. Today we are going to do a quick review of Reiner Holtzimmer's documentary, Margiela in His Own Words. The documentary premiered on Friday of last week. I was able to make the trip out to New York to go see it. It was, in short, incredible. Before we move any farther with the review, if you love Martin Margiela's work and you want to understand it in a more in-depth way, I have an ongoing series wherein I analyze all of the Martin Margiela runway shows one episode at a time. So we have plenty of time to go really, really in-depth with each one and really pick apart the nuance of what makes those collections so influential. Those will all be linked down in the description. But yeah, the documentary. Before, in his own words, we only had one full-length documentary and one kind of like joke of a mini doc. We had We Margiela, which dives very deep into the house's history by talking to all of the former design team and the makeup and the hair people. Basically everyone in the house who had a stake other than Martin was able to speak in that documentary and talk about the work that they collectively built. There's also this like 11 minute thing called The Artist is Absent and it's just 11 minutes of people assuring you that Martin Margiela is in fact very important. That one's not so great. But this documentary was able to really kick the door down and start a whole new conversation because instead of talking to everyone else who was involved in the Margiela vision, they literally just spoke to Margiela. I can't imagine how you would have found this video if you do not know at least a little bit about Martin Margiela, but just in case, he is incredibly secretive. He prioritizes his privacy over seemingly anything else in his entire life. From the very beginning of the house, he's always been a relatively shy person, but around the fifth or sixth runway show, he decided that he was going to drop off of the map completely. He was not going to make public appearances. He was going to try to avoid having his picture taken at all costs. He certainly wasn't going to do any kind of interview and he wasn't typically going to be seen by many members of the staff of his own house. We know that he was going to work and that he was working and that he was producing these things and that he was creatively overseeing the entire vision of the house, but there were lots of people who worked there who maybe saw him once a month. And so the fact that the director of this documentary was able to gain enough trust with Martin to be able to sit down with him and have him explain his own work out loud to him is just a huge crazy thing. I'm going to link the entire audio from the Q&A and the talk back at the end of the documentary premiere at the end of this video, but part of that was the director talking about how he was able to garner that trust with Martin. Apparently he got into contact with somebody who was rather close to Martin and asked them if they could ask Martin and Martin eventually emailed the man back. In total, the director said that he had to work through 200 hours of conversation with Martin Margiela in order to make this 90 minute film. I don't know about you, but I want those other 199 hours. That sounds like some excellent podcast material to me. But yeah, 10 out of 10, it's incredible. You have to go see it. I imagine it will be available for digital download at some point in the near future. Additionally, if you haven't seen the other documentary, We Margiela, that one apparently is also coming to digital download sometime in the near future. The issue is that like over half of it is in Belgian and it's only been available to view on Belgian websites. So hopefully we'll have all that cleared up soon and we can have our own Margiela movie marathon sometime soon. Okay, let's move on to the talkback and the Q&A. You'll actually notice after the talkback when they open it up for questions that I am the first one to ask a question, which is why it's a little bit louder because my mouth is closer to the microphone. If you haven't already, go ahead and check out my Margiela series. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Love you guys, mean it. Here's the Q&A. First of all, thank you. Well, actually, yes, please. You had something you wanted to say really quick. This is the first premiere we had uh, in the world, so I must thank a few people uh, minimum. First of all, of course, I want to thank Martin for trusting me and for sharing all his memories with us and with me. It's a pity that I cannot be here and see such a wonderful audience. I also want to thank Aminata Sombe, my co-producer, who was there from the very beginning until the very end, also during the shootings, with, which I mostly did alone, but she helped me carry stuff and everything that was very kind. Uh, I want to thank Deus for the film score, the, the uh, Belgian band. Martin used some of their scores for his shows. It was a pity that we could not use the original music, which is very important for Martin, but our budget did not allow it to pay the Rolling Stones. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Then I want to thank my editor, Helma. He spent many, many days with me in the editing room. We had 200 hours of raw material, a lot of talks with Martin, and it was a hard way to shorten it down to 90 minutes. I want to thank the sound engineer, Philippe Sellier, who did a brilliant sound mix, and I never heard it in such a beautiful quality as today. Thank you again for this wonderful screening room. Uh, I want yeah, to thank all the financial supporters and the people we interviewed. Not all ended up in the final cut, I, I apologize for that, but uh, their information was very helpful in any case. I also want to thank the Maison uh, Magella today, the son of Renzo Rosso is here, Stefano Rosso. We thank you for the support, for giving us your archive material, but, but for allowing us uh, to have access to the videos of Martin. And yeah, last but not least, I want to thank the team, wonderful team of Dog Wolf, who brought the movie here, who entered it to festivals, and we will have a few other festivals with this movie, and they do a wonderful job to make this movie available worldwide. Thank you very much. Great. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you for bringing the film here. Uh, I, I just, I'm going to start off with a couple quick questions, and then I want to open it up to you guys, because I'm sure you have a lot. Um, I have to ask the very basic one, of course, which is, how did you get Margella to agree to be part of this, given how much he did not want to sort of be on camera and those sorts of things? Can you talk a little bit about the process of securing that? I, I wrote an email. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, but not to him himself because I didn't have his email address, but I wrote it to some people I, I knew he trusted and he worked with. And uh, yeah, after four months or so, there came a response and he said he wanted to meet. And I think I was lucky, first of all, to have uh, those people supporting me who knew, knew him and he trusted. And the second thing was, uh, it was, I think it was the best moment to do it by coincidence in a way because he was preparing that exhibition in, in, that you see in the beginning and in the end, the preparation work for it. And, um, and so he simply wanted to have someone to shoot this because he was very proud at that moment. Uh, and it was very extraordinary for him to have 110 designs, outfits from all the uh, women collections he did of, over his whole career and he thought he will never have a chance to, to do that again. So I was interested of course in a documentary and I said okay I'm open to, to do anything because I was hoping once I meet him then we know each other that he might trust me and once he sees how I work, uh, how I shoot, then maybe more is possible and after we shot maybe four weeks or so in the basement of Galliera, we knew each other much better and then he, he was open for that documentary. And, and so at what point did you decide the visual look of the film in terms of filming his hands and the archival material? But at what point, did, was that a collaborative decision on your part? How did you come to that decision to, to film that way? It, it, it was out of poverty. <laughs> More or less the decision. You did not have so many choices in that case. And uh, yeah, so from the very beginning, it was clear that we cannot show his face. I was not afraid of that, to be honest, because I bet and I hope, thought and I, I hope it worked out uh, for you as an audience that it doesn't really matter if you see the face or not. Uh, you, you get kind of intimate with him when you get close to him. And I always hope that people might feel they have seen him and never miss the face. The second problem was the voice. He did not want to talk, uh, or he wanted to talk, but uh, because I needed all this information, because you cannot read the information in books, and uh, there's not many, many, uh, many stuff, much stuff available for research. And so, because he never gave interviews for the last thirty years, and never showed his face, so I needed his information, of course, and, and the narration. So we taped his inf information, the narr narration, his voice, but his wish in the beginning was that we should have uh, another voice, like uh, an actor or an actress was, was a proposal of him speaking his sentences. I thought 
I would accept it if you had no other choice because I was so happy to, to have him talk in any case. And so for me, the most important thing was not to lose him, right. that he will stay until the end of this project with us. And, but I was hoping and trying to convince him that, that we can use his voice because I think it's uh, at least something more personal, yes. especially when you don't see the face. And yeah, it, it, it took a while, uh, but he finally accepted and, to, and got used to hear right. his own voice. Yeah. Uh, and one last one for me before I turn it over. Uh, did you know that the ending of the film was going to be that question and that and that answer? Was that just like a fortuitous uh, situation? For you? I mean, I mean, you, 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 the, the way we shot. I must tell you, and this explains how the end was was made. Um, so, so the, in the beginning, it was very hard for Martin to talk. So he wanted to read things. He prepared things. And this, there might be some filmmakers here. It never works uh, out in the end. It's not doesn't sound good and doesn't sound authentic. So I said, I don't, I don't think we, we, we can read. And he tried, he wanted to try. He tried a second time, reading, reading, reading. And he asked my opinion, and how does it sound? I said, it's read, it's not spoken. And uh, I let him listen also. And then he, sa he said, yeah, it's, it's terrible. It's, you hear that I read it, so I could convince him. It took a while. And then he said, oh my god, he was almost a little bit desperate. What, what shall we do now? What shall we do? And I said, Martin, it's very simple. This morning when I came with my camera to your studio, you talked for one and a half hours, endlessly, not stopping, about what you want me to tell her today. And what, the moment I set up the camera, you got stuck and blocked. So I said, Tomorrow, I, when I come back again, I give you a wi wireless microphone. You don't talk before you have that microphone to me, and then we let it run the whole day. So you can imagine, in the end of the shooting with him, it was like 40, 42 days, more or less. Uh, I had those 200 hours of footage. So I was in the editing room, and the camera mostly pointing white wall or something. It was I, I was I, I was alone with him, so I recorded it on the card uh, of the camera. So then, in the editing room, you do not watch, you do not look at the monitor. You just listen because you, it's not worth looking at the at the image because it's just the white wall. So I was listening, listening, listening for hours, for days, and so on, making my choices. And suddenly, I looked to the monitor, and this, these glasses were put at the end of a conversation uh, on, in the book. And I, thought, and I screamed. I, I was laughing loud. I thought, this must be the end. This is so, so exciting. And the words he said, uh, they are not spoken at the same time in the original. I put it together in that way because that's the easy thing when you have someone who doesn't want to show his face, then it's very easy to edit the sound. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, that's wonderful. I'd love to open up to questions from the audience. Don't be shy. Yes, right here, please. Was, was no actually the last thing that he said in that conversation? Was no actually the last thing he said in that no, conversation? No, we had more conversations later than but you know, so sometimes we talked about the beginning and then we talked in a chron chronological order about mm -hmm. his career. And one day we had to talk about the last collection then that, that, that he had, the last show. And you know, we went on talking, it was not, not the very end. But this is like, a, like an editing idea we, sure. we had in the editing room. And he loved that too. He smiled a lot too. Uh, next question. Yes, please. Considering how little So, uh, the, yeah. So, I, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the question is because, uh, given how little Margella talked about his past, would you consider an extended cut or extended version where he talks more about it? Is that what you? Right. Yeah. yeah. Will it be? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> no we, we, we are not planning it. Uh, he would have loved it in a way. When, when, I mean, he, he was involved very much in the editing process, in the whole shooting process. Process, as I said before, I did not want to lose him. I wanted him uh, because I know from other filmmakers who tried films about it, and he often ran away. He, he quit the project, and 
but mostly before they started shooting. So, but there were already budgets and, and titles and stuff like that. So I was very careful with him, and for me, it was the most important thing to to, to keep him. And um, what was the question? Again? Oh, to, yeah, it was just about the what, if you would do an if, if I would do the other one. Yeah, and so so we, we, he talked a lot, of course, and. For him, everything is important. Every sketch he made in his childhood, and so and you and he he said, "Oh, it's a pity that we have to cut out so much." It was was a painful, uh, painful experience for him. I, I think I can honestly say, uh, and he was sad about that. And th th then he said, "So can we do a DVD, an extra DVD?" But you will not. You you have you need ten DVDs. It's a box. <laughs> it's not one DVD. If you really want to put it all. In. And I said to Martin, the only way we can do it is to produce it ourselves because your fans will buy that, the hardcore court fans, but this is maybe not enough to, to get all the production uh, together. So let's see what happens. I suspect this room might buy those 10 CDs, but you know, mm -hmm. uh, let me go to Jim. I love the film. Thank you. As an older person, the film, the, the room is full of young people, and, and it's just so wonderful. My question has to do with the voices that spoke about him, particularly the American voice, Captain. Did he have any role in saying who should speak, or did he have a choice of, did he like it or not like it? So we, so yeah, just really let me, let me repeat it. So the question is about the interview subjects that you had speaking about uh, uh, Margella. Did he, did Margella himself had any role in picking who those people were, or if they disagreed or any, or they, you know? Yeah, you can say every decision we made was a common decision between us. He was was involved in everything. There's another another movie called We Margella. Maybe some of you have seen that, which shows more the side of his partner uh, uh, or the the vision of. Uh, Jenny Myrens, who died a couple of years ago, that's why we could not ask her uh, to post participate in that movie. And we said the only thing what, what is important for us is that we do not take the same people that are in We Margella because uh, we, we wanted to make an own movie and not referring to, to this other one. And yeah, that was, was more or less the decision we had. And then yeah, he did Kathy Horry, for example. He, I think he l likes what she wrote, and I think also for him, uh, he wanted to give something back to her, uh, give, giving her a chance to talk about the work now. And I'm very happy she's here, by the way, or maybe she left, I don't know. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. No, I was very happy because I think it's very hard to find someone who talks so honestly about the profession, the co Colleagues, not naming names, but mentioning names, but about how how fashion press usually works, sadly, very uh, often, uh, and that was very important. And I think Martin, he he really wanted to have her in the in the in the movie because she was there from the very beginning and wrote about most of his collections. Okay. Time for just a couple more. I'm going to go to you. Yeah. Like, like, like. So, it's really sorry, just because I'm not sure everybody heard it. But the question is really about, like, do you think that he felt melancholic about leaving fashion the way he did, and is part of the reason for doing this project uh, to revisit his career? No, this is not the reason why he did the the project. Uh, uh, and he's not melancholic. He's very happy that he's out of that business because uh, the year after he left, he s suffered even physically from the stress, the pressure. Uh, that he put himself on more or less during the 20 years he worked in that profession because he always had the goal, he, he once said to me, it always had to be something 
that has never seen before. And you can imagine as an artist, as a filmmaker, if I would make every movie in a different way than, than, than the one before, it, it's, it's a lot of pressure that you have. But for him, this was very important. So in the end, and even today, he's happy that he's in another world, in a different world, where he can set the rhythm, the pace, everything. And he's a very, in a way, way he's a bit a slow person because he's he goes so much into detail of things and to the ground of an idea, and yeah, and that doesn't really fit the the pace of fashion today in a, in a commercial way, in a commercial sense, I think. Yeah. No, he's not melancholic at, at all, yeah. There were, there were good times, he enjoyed some things, but overall I think he looks at it as a struggle. It was always a, a, a tough struggle. We have time for, I think, one last one, and I'll go to you. I have a question for you. Are you working on your next project? What is it about? Your next, you're working on your next project to tell us about it. <laughs> Uh, I, I, so this was my second documentary about fashion, and I think three would make it complete. <laughs> a box, a box, a, a, a smaller size box. So, but I cannot say anything about it in detail. It's not, nothing is under contract. We approach a few people, my co-producer and I, so, but nobody said yes or shouted yes. So, so it's not easy to, to get those people. So the mystery conti continues for you. One, one last question right over here, please. Uh, was there any thought of having uh, Red Barroso contributing to the, to the documentary? It, it, it's, it's, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, can you just, sorry. Uh, he's asking me, if, did I have the thought to, to have Renzo Rosso yeah. in, in the movie also? I think this, this is, a, is a good question, and I thought about it, yes. I was talking to Martin about it, what he thinks, and he says, I never met Renzo, so I cannot say anything about the man. And the person, but but he says he's so powerful. So what, if, once you have him in the in the movie, then he kills the rest. He takes it over. That was the position of of Martin. And I think it's a bit competition feeling from Martin's side, of course. I thought I was thinking about would it be necessary, but I think this movie is a little bit like a self-portrait. So it's the, the main thing of this mo movie, and that was the idea from the beginning, is having him tell his story and not have a journalistic outside view that says that this is wrong, this is right, or there's another truth in, in, if, if we have friends. Or, and it's also on the same, on the same side, it's, this is not complaining about rents, or I mean, Renzo is like many other people in, in this business and they have to make the money, they have to sell. And you, I really want to say, without Renzo, Martin would have stopped much earlier because they never made money with the, with the brand. So it saved him, I don't know, six, seven years of, of his career or so. So, but I had the thought, but in the end I thought it's, no, I, I, I want to keep it more, more, uh, yeah, if, the voice of my tongue. So we do have to wrap up, but I want to thank you so much for bringing this fantastic company.